Where's Fielder? He's gone to the dogs. Welcome to the Gone to the Dogs podcast. This is your host, Steve Fielder, coming at you one more time through the miracle of Al Gore's internet here and a lot of equipment that neither my guests nor I understand very well, but we've managed to hook up today, and I've got a great guest for you. Uh, If you've been looking at the announcements on uh, social media, you know who our guest is, and man, this should be a wild ride today. We're really looking forward to visiting with our guest. I want to take just a moment before we do that to thank the people at DU Hunting Supply, W Hunting Supply. You can catch them online at dusupply.com. Anything you need for your hounds, for your hunting, for your apparel, uh, and especially great customer service. These guys are top of the line. DU Hunting Supply. It's dusupply.com online. Well, that pays the bills, and I will put in one little plug for some of you who have been asking me about the book, Gone to the Dogs, A Coon Hunter's Journey. The book is still available. The uh, inventory is shrinking, so if you want a copy of this book and you've been thinking about it now at the time, you can get that online at stevefielderbooks.com. Okay, without further ado, I am chomping at the bit to introduce to you my guest today, someone that you probably, if you don't know this guy, you certainly heard about him, especially if you're on social media these days. Real happy to have you on board today with us today, today, today. I said that twice, didn't I? Norm Starling. Do you prefer Norm or Norman? You know, Steve, when I was younger, um, Nobody asked me any questions, and my name was Norman. And just one day when people started asking me questions about the same time in my life, they started calling me Norm. And I thought, well, man, as soon as I became this new guy where I went from Norman to Norm, people started asking me questions. Before that, I think I was too dumb. So when I was dumb, my name was Norman, and then one day it just became (laughs) Norm. Kind of like James and Jim. I got you. Well, there was an old 50s or 60s or something rock song. Of course, you were not old enough to uh, remember that. It was called Norman, and it, the words went Norman, and then the song went ooh, 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 you know? ooh Norman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, you heard the song. Well, you guys take your thought to an old soul, so no, I've heard that song before. <laughs> and I mean, just having that name, I think, you know, put a label on my head right from the beginning, but before we get too far into this thing, Steve, can I talk about who pays my bills? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, the Hocus Pocus Coon Squaller and Nighttime Honey Productions. Um, is it Honey Productions? Yeah, he producted me into a baby steak. He was the only guy that was nice enough to give me a little bit of equipment and my woman a smile as I left my dog at the Coon Club and went on my cast without my dog and then got treated very poorly with no spectators. But I was still wearing some good products, and it's probably – who pays my bills is, I think, only fair that we, we 50 it. Nighttime hunting pest supplies did that for me. Well, good. All right. There you go. So look them Can up. Can we talk on... about my other sponsor? Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. It's your show, Norm. Go for it. I'd like to thank my lady friend for supporting me walking around in the woods all hours of the night. Oh, yeah. Well, coon hunters know for sure uh, having a good woman behind us is uh, – and and as I just heard on a, another podcast uh, on Coon Hunting University about a lady coon hunter, Katie Millwood, where her husband is the support group there and kind of really, uh, you know, makes it possible for her to follow her dreams, too. So absolutely, we'll give a shout out, shout out to the women out there. Hey, man, most of the people out there, know you through this one-on-one coon league on facebook and uh tell me a little bit about that and how that got started well steve it's kind of the story starts before that though rather really i mean um if you say it's my show i can shut up anytime you say something important or at least say something that i need to listen to but should we talk about where I started coon hunting from? Or should we go with that, I mean, no, I we're no, no, worst. no, you do not. You do not get to direct the show. That's my job. Okay, but we'll start anywhere that you want. You want to talk about your background of coon hunting? 
let's go it go for well, it. it has to, I think it almost is like a priority thing with uh, how it goes in line because like how I started the Coon League had to do with how I was raised. Okay, let's go there. Okay, so I mean, I was raised in Canaan, Ohio, spelled just like the Bible, um, and I coon hunted as a child. We we was the, the coon furs were worth dog food money, so Dad was happy. Mom was mad we missed the school bus, but uh, when we when we hunted when we was younger, sometimes it would depend on whether we had a bag of dog food or whatever. When when my folks was young, we lived in a one bedroom sawmill that was in Canaan, Ohio, just like in the Bible. And it was moved up the road, put on a foundation, and had a couple of dishes too, because my dad worked hard. But in that Canaan, Ohio was a little killbuck creek, and we went up and down there as neighbor kids catching crawdads and meeting at the uh you know the, the bridge that would go over for one of the driveways to the farms that we can on it. And we would meet at that bridge with a piece of Elvita cheese and a crawdad. And whoever had the big, biggest crawdad would put them in a circle made out of rocks and dust and we would take them crawdads and they both go for the cheese. And when they would get to each other, they would pull backwards. And it was always a wrestling thing. It was a one-on-one for me. So I guess as a child doing the crawdad one-on-one competition, it gave me an idea later in life. <laughs> that's very interesting. I never heard of a crawdad wrestling match. That's, no, I mean, that's... It was a crawdad fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I spent three years in Japan and I got to be quite uh, fond of sumo wrestling over there. And that was kind of a unique form of wrestling. And then, and I'm going to segue into something that uh, you you and I have in common. When I was a kid growing up back in the hills of West Virginia, there the local radio station in Oak Hill, West Virginia, had a thing called uh, Saturday Night Wrestling, and it <laughs> it was definitely not the UFC or or uh, Hulk Hogan. Uh, quality of wrestling but in any way the saturday night wrestling so anyway i got off on a on a rabbit path there for sure but can we talk about that a little bit our common our common roots sure no i mean i think that's what i do sometimes that people can't follow me steve i think that you'll be able to follow me because i think sometimes i talk in parables and circles just as well as you do but i've read some <laughs> articles I've not I've not listened to any of your podcasts, but I have read some of your articles and some of the stuff you wrote, sir. You're very talented, and I, I appreciate the opportunity. I really do. So, like, um, anytime you want to go on one of your rabbit rants, you're more than welcome, sir, <laughs> as far as I go. Sure. Okay, Norm. Well, uh, this podcast I knew would be interesting, and that's why I wanted to bring you on. And uh, you told me that your grandfather was from the same part of the country that I'm from, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, he Was he born and raised there in Beckley, West Virginia, where I was? No, he was raised in a little holler that was up here uh, local, but my grandfather had come from the coal mine, so he, my dad got the Johnny Cash raising. You know, I was started off, hey, if you help us handle the dogs, we'll buy you some tobacco. Okay, so we went and worked and chased dogs all over the place, and you know, we got to some chewing tobacco, but I wouldn't change my raising for nothing because, you know, that, that coon hunting now has went from there to going out and, and, and bringing back a, a, a pelt worth 20, 25 bucks, 30 bucks. Back uh, then, that was a lot of money. Back in so the now, day. Yeah, it yeah. certainly was. Uh, well, okay, let's. Um, so, uh, your was your grandfather a coon hunter back in West Virginia? When I was little, we lived in a little valley, Overton Valley, and I think that I think a lot of times the people from the coal mines down there come up here chasing the unions, and a lot of hardworking people come out from down there to come up here just to get a better life. And I think that's where my, you know, my grandfather settled in. The Starling mm-hmm. settled in that Overton Valley there. It's just 13 miles long with uh, just a bunch of lakes and 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 a, and a Kilbuck Creek that runs through the middle of it. But when I went to my grandfather's house, there was always American Cooner all over the floor, the, the front porch. There was chickens running around, and we had salamanders we would go run and catch and just you know the backyard of my grandfather's face looked like chickens and dogs tied up throughout the, the thing but all of them looked very healthy and happy because they were fed and exercised mm-hmm. uh, now was this in west virginia or in ohio where this was in wayne county ohio a little place okay. called overton the overton valley and you said meg's county no sir that would be oh. in wayne county ohio oh, oh wayne county okay okay yeah Good, good. Well, that's that's amazing, and and there is definitely a, a 
a large number uh, down through history of coon hunters that came from southern Appalachia, Appalachia, excuse me, uh, you know, many of them from eastern Kentucky that migrated to Michigan to the uh, auto factories and, and uh yeah, the well, union, they went for the money, for sure. What, well, sure, absolutely. Yeah. We used to jokingly say, back in West Virginia, you learn the three R's in school. You learn reading, writing, and Route 21 to Cleveland. Those were the three subjects that you learned when you were in school up there, or down there. Uh, okay, so right now, uh, Norm, just fast forward a little bit. What kind of work do you do besides coon hunting? I started out as a carpenter, and, you know, construction was always a thing because of my Johnny Cash raising, you know, being in Wayne County, Ohio, having the uh, Johnny Cash uh, coal mine, Beckley, West Virginia raising. I, I, I basically swung a hammer just to and, and climb the ladder every day of my life, up and down, up and down, to get, you know, essential air put in my single wide on the side of a hill. and. Uh, just started from that and it built it into when the market crashed in, in 98 with the housing industry, I kind of shifted gears and went into commercial, but I built a lot of restaurants clear across the country. We even had one that I built in Toledo, Ohio, that ended up being on the uh, undercover boss. And I got involved as a general contractor, but I helped design some of it. So it was probably my favorite store that I ever built, but I'm a general contractor by trade. Do restaurant specialization is my pizza shops. I gotcha. I gotcha. Well, I knew all of us had to have something, I guess, to finance our coon hunting habit. And uh, that that's good to know. Absolutely. So you are how old right now, Norm? I'm 47, my friend. 47. Okay. Well, I've got you, but not quite 30 years, about 28. So, okay. Let me to tell you my most intelligent thought to date. Yeah, absolutely. My most intelligent thought to date, and then we got to go back to tell you, to finish the story of where the coon league came from but to my most intelligent thought today was at 45 years old i became a 45 year old man i turned into a 35 year old man because i decided the love for a woman i needed and my children needed to change and i decided not to drink anymore and when i went sober the first 60 days i believe i went 10 years younger so i was at 45 years old it's almost been two years actually over two years i don't count but i'll never drink again but at the point where when I went sober, my most intelligent thought, because the first 60, I felt younger. And I believe that within the 90 days of me going sober with no more alcohol, I believe that I became more intelligent. And when I did that, it was my most intelligent thought right off the bat was that I might be the ignorant one that can't run this equipment to set this up. I might be the one that has my phone on, do not disturb. So as I'm pointing a finger, I think we're all guilty of that sometimes. But my most intelligent thought was that when I was trying to direct people in business and coon hunting and raising children, was that I might be the ignorant one. And when I learned that, then I started being better at my job, better at parenting, better at, you know, my relationship with my woman, better relationship with my mother, just, you know, all my children. It just, it, it worked out better because I started admitting that I was wrong. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, we often say in this world of hounds that a man's ego is a, a, a terrible burden for a hound to, to carry, but uh, it applies to us as well. You know, I think we all, uh, you know, uh, I, we used to say about my family, you know, we have the utmost confidence in the accuracy of our opinions, you know. And <laughs> so uh, I, I think we all uh, don't like to admit that we're wrong sometimes, that we might make a mistake. And I think that that carries on into the coonhound world too, because once we put that dog, our name on that dog's collar, then we kind of carry that over to the dog. Well, the dog now, that's my dog. Therefore, that dog can't make a mistake. That dog doesn't do anything wrong because it belongs to me. Let's go back and talk about this one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one Coon League. How did that start? And uh, tell us all about it. Well, I guess as my childhood was, um, you know, I was raised very old school. And when I took them morals, I remember thinking all the thought, things that my father said to me and my mother, but my father was, you know, had certain things he was tricked about and other things not so much. But w when I learned it, those things that he did not, or that he said to me that I did not like, later in life, I found myself saying them to my children. 
and then realizing why. And if my father was here, I'd you know, probably kiss his feet and tell him he was right. And thanks for teaching me all the things he did because I could be not running a coon hound, not living such a beautiful life. I could not even know the sport. So I think sometimes, I think when I, when I got a little bit older and, you know, I had Brandon Feist, Jacob, um, these were my stepchildren. I raised them the best I could because I felt like that was the thing to do and I was just passing it down. And when I raised these kids to do their heritage, which was passed on to me, I just was doing the things that my father taught me and what it did for me. It made me want to go to work. You all right? Yes, I am. I am. I okay. had a little coughing spell there, but I didn't realize that you could hear me. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Did you, have, did you have it on mute there, Steve? I guess that's the unedited version of things, but <laughs> I, I guess my my father, just having that, I taught my children then to hunt, and um, those children would come home and they would just basically, you know, dad, it's not right. It's not right. Well, they get a better dog. If they're going to cheat you, just get you a better dog they can't argue with. Because my dad always says it was excuses. And, you know, you just went and got a better dog and a better dog. And, you know, after I'd gotten sober at 45 years old, um, the boys just having those hounds around, the, Shane Clark, um, I always said he was my, my redheaded stepson and I never knew his mother. And his mother used to come watch him in the wrestling ring and we used to wrestle. and. You know, so some of that ground, uh, crawdad, crawfish, whatever y'all call them down there, we would have those one-on-one -on -one bouts. It was personal between me and the neighbor boy because whichever crawdad pulled that other one out of the ring with the cheese kind of won. And it was like, I got to get a better crawdad tomorrow. So I was <laughs> raised in this life to be, you know, competitive. And I always told my, my wife, you know, if, if my children need to be competitive because you see Burger King moving next to McDonald's, man, we got to get these kids ready. So. I always taught my kids to be very competitive. And when they started coming home telling me that cheating was going on, I don't know if it was so much cheating. It was just what you talked about earlier, Steve. I think sometimes our pride gets in our way. I know because when my children would be out there, I'd be proud of them swinging the bat. And then sometimes there would be a bad call. I'd use a lot of the excuses. And it really should have just went to my child and be like, you know what? Quit making excuses. It was your fault. You know how to swing at that ball. And I think that alone, teaching my children that, and then, later just having them come home so much and these guys having the dogs around me, I was, I started to uh, think alcohol was my friend, Steve, it, it, you know, through my divorce, because once I started into it after 14 years of marriage, I, you know, I started drinking and I always remember thinking, you know, dad used to always say a good coon hunter is never a drunk and a good drunk's never a good coon hunter. So I got to thinking to myself, you know, that's, there's some truth to that. And this dog ended up coming along named airplane. And it was just a cross that I did on some dogs back in the day. And the boys having the dogs still around and hunting. Yeah, Dad, you're going to coon up one day, me drinking. Think, yeah, I'll go with your boys. Empty cans, leaving them all over. When I caught myself and went sober, a dog jumped in the truck named Airplane. The first time I ever walked into Airplane 3, rather. The first time I ever walked into a tailgate. And that's what started me going back into coon hunting. And when I got back into coon hunting, I noticed that all these kids, and, and, and different gentlemen that showed up at these hunts, I didn't know them anymore. And during my break and I was drinking, I didn't catch up with a lot of it. But when I got back into it, I noticed there was a huge problem. And, you know, I was always the one, Steve, that got kicked out for treating a couple of raccoon because them guys didn't like me. Nobody likes to get raccoon treat on them. And I'm not saying my dogs was always the best, but I've never had trouble with a cast I lost. So when I, when I started going back, the boys would go to a couple of hunts with me. And, you know, we started just kind of, turning the camera on and thinking, well, all these, hey, buddy, you say there's a coon in the tree, huh? I have coon hunting with your father for a lot of years. He's on here. I mean, what do you think? Maybe maybe he flipped and have a good talk with you about that tree. You're trying, you and your buddies are plussing that up. So to the point where that gave me an idea of the crawdad, the one-on-one, -on -one, that, you know, I, 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 I got to thinking, I'm like, I got all excited. I'm like, I, I, you know, I have this young dog. I mean, it's coming up. Like, I'm going to make a statement here. I called Alan Gigrich. Everybody know Alan Gigrich. I mean, how long have you known Mr. Allen? Um, Steve, uh, I met him when he was a very young, uh, young man, uh, attending Beagle events up around Albion, uh, Indiana, uh, back in my UKC days. So Alan and I've known each other for a long time. I made it in the finals of the world hunt, uh, um, with my Beagles and a man lied to me about what time of day it was. And I told them people if they was going to lie to me. I was going to go back to the dark, at least the coon hunter. I wasn't going to know and see it for myself what time of day it was. So I, I, I used to run a lot of beagles. And 
uh, some of the success I had, I always said, every time I go to a hunt and see a nice dog, I'd swallow my pride. See, we talked about pride. Sometimes I think that that stops us from getting what we want. But when I when I called Mr. Alan Gigrith about my idea, I was very excited. And, you know, there was a lot of the COVID stuff going on and everything. But I told Alan, I'm like, look, and I knew Todd Callum from back in. I think my first Beagle trophy was in 1998. No, I'm sorry, 1989. I reversed that. A little dyslexia for you, Steve. <laughs> yes. Well, well, you know, the you heard about the dyslexic atheist, didn't you? No. Oh, tell he, me. he says there is no dog. There is no dog. Yeah, that's the dyslexic atheist. Ah. Well, okay, Carry so on. I, I got it right. But anyhow, so I go back to Todd Callum days to where, like, you know, I just remember respecting the people and just seeing what they've done with the, the, the dogs and the hounds and, 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 and the competitive edge. And my kids are following it now. They want to follow it. But I, I always looked up to these people. When I, but when I called Alan Gigrich about that that day, we had the COVID stuff going on and everything else. And it was I had this idea. I thought, you know, just watching the kids and going through wrestling. And my boy Brandon Feist, I mean, his freshman year, I was proud of the boy. He went to state and you know, just did well with himself. And he's even now still got his high school, you know, his freshman girlfriend. Um uh, from when he was little and he's now 24 years old so it's just like you know watching these kids grow up in this sport and seeing people like that when i called alan was excited about this i thought my kids could compete we could one-on-one it it would be more legit and if we throw a camera on these people we'll I have a big jury i mean the camera's going to be the jury like even like where we had about not long ago where my son just lost the battery pack the one that's supposed to be hooked up to that camera and the phone went dead so it was a void and nil we took a picture together and i talked about how you know, my dog did do a few things better, but so did his dog. So we got to redo it now because the camera, the jury went off. So when I had the idea, I called Alan Gigrich and he kind of made fun of me and ended up, you know, telling me there's no way in Sam that there's <laughs> going to be any type of. Yeah, he's like, there's no way in Sam Hill there's going to be any type of kennel club get behind it. And I was thinking, like, I really didn't even want anybody to get behind it. Like, what do you mean? Like, there's an idea here? Like. Oh, like maybe I should, maybe I should do my, well, Norm, everybody's tried to do a one-on-one. I'm like, well, I know, but accepting no is failure. So as long as I listen to my instincts that did all my business and I just be like Donald Trump and I just don't accept no, I just keep pulling until I get what I need, I at least will be good at something. So I always teach my children and people in business, success is in yes. If you accept no, you are a failure, throw in the white towel, Steve. Well, in defense of Alan and anybody else that's in the registry game, which I I devoted 33 years of my life to that, uh, you know, you have to have uniformity all across the board. So in order to implement a program like that, you would have to have every coon club across the United States and Canada uh, equipped with the video uh, cameras and so forth and video every every cast and have uh, someone to review all that and make the final decisions and all that. So I certainly understand his standpoint. However, you know, I do think the concept is very interesting and certainly entertaining as uh, witnessed, you know, by uh, the kind of attention you've been getting online. Do you have any idea how many people are watching these one-on-one contests, and I see that there are other, uh, that's one thing I want you to explain to me while uh, I have you, uh, Norm, is people are now uh, picking up on this and holding their own one-on-ones across the country, aren't they? Yeah, but I, I think I think a bigger thing here, a bigger picture is, once I got older and more mature and realized I was the one, that's why I'm the best know-it-all is because I was the one that was wrong. So I always tell my children, anybody that I love, I'm the best know-it-all you know, people. Yeah, whatever, Dad. Well, no, I am because I'm the better at apologizing now that I know I might be the ignorant one. So learning that, I started you know, thinking, well, maybe you're right, just like you said. And Steve, I appreciate your ability and what you did with UKC to get where it needs to be. And I don't know where it's at now, but I can just tell you, I've seen a lot of things, and you were, I was always a fan of yours, uh, what you've done with the organization. And and I'm not trying to say Alan Gigrich or Todd Kelm or anybody's not done a well job because the tournament champions look very pretty from what I've seen of it. I just think that, in, in general, when I had the idea, I didn't realize that you're right. It would be take a lot of things. So I was just going to play around with it myself. At least mm-hmm. I would go do a few hunts, and I 
you know, there was some stuff that happened, some controversy where my kids were accused of certain things. That, and it was like, it was just the people that was crucifying it that was hating. So like, I wasn't really mad at anybody through the thing, but I had this idea. I wanted it to kind of work. And I thought to myself, you know, if eventually if monkey see monkey do, and someone sees and likes it, everybody will, will want to do it. So I just started policing it the best I could online to, hey, if you're proud of something, you should be able to tell tell someone about your boy's swing. If you've been out there swinging that ball with that boy, you're, you should go to the Little League and sit in there and be proud of it. He gets treated bad because he's knocking the ball out of the, the park every round. You know what I mean? Like, I played wiffle ball with my stepkids to the point where, like, you know, even my fiance Kelly, her, her, her daughter can swing a bat. Like, she goes up every time she gets up there. Well, she worked really hard at that. She deserves she can. So I think that the, the, the we need these kids to have a little bit of pride and look at people. And I think punching the ball and getting up and being motivated about having a bout coming up made me motivated. And then monkey see, monkey do. I put it on the Internet and then people started, Norm, I'm a walker guy, but my kid don't want no walker dog no more. So you ruined him. He needs the ball to punch and he wants a blue dog. <laughs> at the point where I think when I originally started doing that, I thought to myself, man, maybe I do have a following here. And then people like Pee Wee saying to me, hey, look, um, if these people still like me on here, I'm, I, I might, and they, I'm kind of becoming a big deal now. He goes, I'm going to need some more money. I thought, you know what? Pee Wee's the boy that takes care of my kennel when I'm not around. And he helps us on the Coon League. And we, we take and pay him to do that. And the kid's very proud of it. I mean, um, I bought a pair of boots. He knows I bought, I, I bought the pair of boots, I think big because he wore them the other night. And I wear a size 10 and the poor Pee Wee, he wears a size 11. So these boots now are going to be donated to him for the Coon League. And it's a really nice pair of lacrosse boots. And he just never had a pair and he's never been around dogs. But now he's like, hey, I want a Coon on. Hey, I want to. And, and I think that's the motivation here. I mean, let, let's just let's we have a future here. I want to build a foundation of something, some sort for the Blue Tick Association to do something for the youth, because the two I think that we had in place now is not going to work. So I think. If we got to get better blue ticks to the gate to win with some of these other dogs that are winning, I think that we we need a little bit of energy behind it. So I just went hard and look, I, I had very talented dogs from Mr. Ed Mead, Ron Taylor, Dave Dean, and that's why I kept my dogs the way their names because it was Jets Northern Blue. And I even had Dave Dean's daughters call me and message me on Facebook and tell me they appreciated and wanted to know why I kept the Northern Blue on there. Like it was respect to the people that did the work before me. I got you. And and that's that's a, a point well taken, uh, Norm. I want to ask you about your dogs, but have we have we pretty I, I don't want to leave this one on one Coon League just quite yet because I wanna ask you, uh, have you uh charted or or uh, uh re, what's the word I wanna use? Have you reviewed the results as far as the number of likes or or comments and things like that to have any idea of how many people are watching these uh your videos and so forth i mean really i kind of dodged that bullet the first time you asked me it's steve and you know i don't want to I, I you know I, I would like to just go ahead and tell you like how many countries were listening they're listening and how many people from different foreign languages sure. are saying good night buddy and telling me and sending me videos of their dog running a really neat rabbit they're inviting me down like <laughs> to go run these big large rabbits and i'm like these rabbits are so neat like so i think we got there's followings of people watching translations sure. of just you know i think duck dynasty's been there long enough why can't we like i yeah. think our dogs are prettier we've worked harder at them why can't we just go to the next level so sure. I'm, i think the dogs are going to go to tv that's where it's going to be and uh as far as the views and stuff I can tell you we're in like uh, 12 different countries and there's you know, 200,000 people clicking on this thing in a 28 day format. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we certainly are getting the exposure out there now. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different groups that are doing it, individuals that are doing it. Uh, the UKC, I think, saw the light and uh, developed a media department. As you, you can see the results of that in the last two years with their coverage of the Tournament of Champions. Uh, you see the American uh, uh, Backwoods uh, Heritage Productions that cover the uh, the uh, pro sport events and, and all of that. So we're seeing a lot more uh, video coverage of our sport. Well, I thought, you know, to myself, you know, uh, those guys all know we have an issue, you know, 
and, 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 you know, I would, can I give another shout out? You said the tournament champions, UKC, but can I give a little shout out? Absolutely. Alan Gigrich, I hope you feel better um, soon. I, I, I talked to a good dear friend of mine that thinks a lot of you. And, and, but I would just like to say, you know, now that UKC is going to adopt my idea, um, woo, number one, I win. <laughs> I mean, and not say that like it was a competition, but my motive was for the better of the sport. And if I could show the whole people of what's going on in these casts, and I didn't even mean to, like I wouldn't try and document anything. I was just trying to go out there and show that the sport can be cleaned up and we can cl clap like golf. Why can't we go on there and just take the camera with us and clap like golf, like, hey, good shot, buddy. Good shot, Dale. You good shot, Mr. Golfer. I mean, let's do that. Good shot, Norm. We treat a coon. Uh, good shot, Spurlock, whoever trees the coon. I think that now that they have adapted it, I, I, I appreciate the support because I went out and supported the pro sport. I think I even took some fresh walleye from Mr. Kevin Rash. You know, Kevin Rash took his dad out on a Lake Erie charter when he come up to get airplane and we had a really good catch. We, we caught our limit like now on a really good charter. Good friend of mine. Um, uh, he's a real warriors out of Lake Erie. He actually went and took and put us on fish and then we just had a splendid time come back. I took and carried that wall after we got it clean and I took it to the pro sport hunt out there because I thought, you know, that truck hunt, it would be nice to have some good food out there. Cause I've been to that club before years ago, you know, I've been in that country, but when I went out there, I just carried it to, you know, to support pro sport and what they're doing. Cause I think it's more of a prestige. It's just a chip off. It's making our sport better. Why do we have to hate on each other, Steve? Why can't we all just get along? Like there's, like we're in the sea and there's not enough food. Is that what it is? Maybe we don't need a bigger tank. There's plenty of folks. Yeah. Well, that's for sure. And I've said this many times, Norm, uh, and you won't hear it on this podcast, waging one kennel club against the other, one breed against the other, uh, one handler against the other. Uh, not good for the sport, has no place in it as far as I'm concerned. And I've told people for so many years, you know, hunters themselves, in the whole scope of things, nationwide, the numbers of hunters is is in decline. Uh, the number of hunters is in decline overall. Uh, to use a round number, let's say there's 10% of the population that actually hunts. And that's everything. Deer, ducks, uh, whatever. That you I don't can know if consider. I believe in some of those numbers, Steve. Well, they, they may be understated because some people certainly are not in organizations or there's no way to count them. So I'll give you that. They could be understated. But yeah, the I fact they, is, I'm sorry. No, I'd like to raise my hand like we're in school, but we don't have that video like we talked about. But I, I, I apologize for cutting you off, but I think sometimes just that, that idea and that statement that comes through my head, I got to get it out. So it's like, whoop, I'm sorry. I did not mean to interrupt you, sir. No, no, no. Uh, but here's what I'm trying to say, Norm. Whatever the number is, okay, we'll have to realize that hunters are in a minority in this country in the overall scope of the 300 million people that are here in in the united I, I states think, i think the dnr i think that if i would could I, I just i'm just going to go off the department of natural resources in the state of ohio i think they're 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 overestimating or underestimating hunters and overestimating how many deer are being harvested and i don't know what their motives other than somebody in the flipping state that runs the state maybe some insurance companies probably are pushing off some kind of extra funds on the side of our licenses well we're funding it so at the point we're finding this big ball of these people that can run around and do how they do, I, I, I doubt that we're lack of licenses. If you go look at the people that are involved, I think we have more hunters now today than we ever have. I think the sport's growing. I think that we're going to keep growing if we get more of these old timers in here. And look, the Coon League's not about, like you say, you know, you don't judge. The reason why I don't judge because it wasn't my fault of my DNA. I didn't choose my background. So my cross of what made me as a flesh is the same as the dogs. I'm not going to judge another man's breed or his dog because in you know, those guys, nobody chooses your DNA. So I think a lot of times we're, we're judging these things and we shouldn't be because we're all different. So at the point where, you know, if you look at these numbers that they're saying and claiming that we don't have, that we do No, we have plenty of support there on both ends. It's just, we're all fighting, so no one's working together. And now we have all these different other formats and kennel clubs that are trying to pull from this one vein of, hey, we're addicted to being proud of our dog and we want to come and show it to the people. So you have that right there that's, that you have 
you know, more people that set up. You know, when I was a kid, there was one hunt and they were all there. Like, I mean, I've been kicked out of them for tree and raccoon, for real. Not even, not even trying to make it up. Literally we're tree and raccoon because I didn't put a coon in the tree, Steve. I didn't try to cheat anybody. And I didn't try to tell somebody their dog was moving when it did. So at the point where, like, I remember as a child catching bullfrogs at Medina County Coon Hunters Association, my grandfather helped take them work ethics and build that club. And then I caught a frog around the pond of it as I was raised. So I've been around the coon hunt all my life listening to people saying, well, it's silly because there's always some kind of cheat. Well, I think we have that in every sport, but I think that now that we have this other organizations up and running, there's room. We just need to all share. And that's why I took the walleye that we got from Mr. Rash coming up and, and going hunting with the airplane three dog. And I, I took it to share it with, you know, the guys from pro sport and all that guys, even though there was a lot of things that they did to me, I don't think was fair or nice, but I still keep, you know, I always said to my children, my daughter's a pretty girl. and She was getting picked on a little bit. And I think it was because she had these pretty eyes and this red highlights through her hair. And, 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 and she said, you know, in her feelings, dad, I don't know why they're mean. And I said, well, honey, if they're throwing you lemons, just throw a little bit of honey on that lemon and honey's good for you. It's the only thing sweet we should be eating. Good. Anyway, just throw it in. It'll make a sweet lemon. You don't need much honey. And she said, dad, I just make a lemonade. Yeah. And I thought she yeah. probably read that somewhere. Yeah. Well, the point I was making, it was to a point that you, uh, you vocalized there, Norm, was that uh, about division among the groups and all. All the hunters in the United States combined, I don't care what they hunt, if they hunt field mice with a chihuahua, will not win a referendum on a ballot of, as to whether hunting with dogs should be legalized or banned. Uh, we have to stand together. There is strength in numbers. Uh, coon, hunters is a, uh, coon hunting is a very small segment over of the overall hunter population in the United States. So the point being is, you know, yeah, there is no reason for us to be fighting amongst ourselves. You know, we need to be supporting, and and that's why we, we try to do that on this podcast. I try to be very supportive of the other coon hunting podcasts that are out there because I think they're all doing a good job and they're all presenting a positive light uh, uh, on our sport. sport. Yeah. It's getting, the, you know, I always said the squeaky wheel gets the grease. They want to tell me, you know, Norm, be quiet. Well, if I was a tree dog, you would pet me. I'd be blowing about 120 barks a minute and then maybe <laughs> throwing a couple extra on the side. So I think that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And sometimes, you know, having a podcast, just going out there and telling the story, I think sometimes, you know, Steve, I would like to say, though, because I am a fan of, of yours, I would like to say, I haven't had taken the time to to listen to your podcast, but now that I'm talking to you, I want to go back and listen to some of them. So when I get done in my spare time, I'm going to do that. But one of the things that I want to say to you is, is, you know, people were saying about interviewing me. I had other podcasts ask me if I would do an interview and I didn't entertain it at all until you contacted me. Well, I'm very proud of that, Norm, and I thank you very much because I think you're an interesting guy, and I want your story to be out there, and there's no better way to get a story than going, as we've said so many times, <laughs> down through the years, straight to the horse's mouth. So uh, uh, I'm, I know you're not disappointing our listeners in any way, and I'm very, very proud to have you on the podcast today. Let's talk about your blue ticks. You, you talked about the blue ticks and how you, uh, you know, the background goes to Ed Mead and Dave Dean and, and uh, Ron Taylor and, and those dogs. I have a very uh, high regard for Ed Mead. I uh, trained with him several puppies over the years that I lived in Michigan. I lived there 22 years. I would uh, drive over to Ed's. Uh, I saw many, many of, of uh, 
his puppies uh, that started at incredibly young ages that went on to make top dogs, and we read about them in the magazines and saw their pictures in the major events. Uh, I've seen uh, unbelievable things out of very, very young puppies. And I believe if you go to Ed Mead's today, you'll probably still see my rolling cage there because I don't think Ed gave that back to me when I left. <laughs> but well, uh, I, but I probably listen. I probably used that rolling cage because <laughs> I mean, okay, so. I mean, that's just a big open can of worms. Like, um, let me call the girls and tell them I'm not going to make it because, um, like, I don't even know where to begin. Like, you want to get into <laughs> at me. Like, I thought we were going to get through Norm Starling, but. No, I, no, I, no. I, well, that's okay. I just wanted to know the background go. of your personal dogs no, and talk about Ed your dog. I'd rather be the Ed Mead show. Let's make it the Ed Mead show. So, <laughs> okay, so, no, that's a good subject. You're right. I mean, I'm a fan. Anybody works as hard is something and i always tell my children listen hard work is legendary stuff people i mean i don't know any legend that works hard that don't become a legend do you hear me so at the point where ed meads worked that hard for that many years no i'm an ed man ed, ed man ed man mead fan there you go how about that one for a jumble up <laughs> too much coffee perhaps steve yeah you might want to cut the, the caffeine down a little bit there <laughs> norm <laughs> Did Steve just tell me to put the caffeine down? Because I'm, I'm about halfway through this cup. You know what? Let me change it up to water again. You know what? All right, so we're going to switch it up to some coffee for Ed Mead, but I, I'd like to talk about how I met him. Sure. Um, okay, so I had beagles, and I was uh, living in Michigan up in the Thumb, and I bought a house, and I was doing sub, uh, subdivisions, and I had a kid that was beagle hunting with me, and his name was Jeremy Yarbrough. And he had an old female that he had bred to Jet Six. And we had beagle hunted quite a bit together, just running rabbit dogs and whatever. And he liked this dog I had named Buddy. And he was nice. He retrieved rabbits and he'd bring them back and drop it at your feet. And he was young and he was out of a dog that I'd bred to retrieve rabbits. So he just, it was genetic and he wanted this dog bad. And it wasn't for sale, but I liked this gentleman. And we did business together. He ended up starting an excavation business off of my uh, housing development. But Anyhow, we become friends, and one night we went down, and we were going to go coon hunt. Now, to back up a little bit, Steve, you know how we're both going back and forth. I'd like to go back to where my childhood, my dad had walker dogs. They was clover bred, and I remember the first time watching a Pac-Man dog tree and talking about they didn't care if a dog had a coon up it or not. It was such a tree dog. They'd watch it. So I come from that era of, of, of walker dogs. We didn't hunt blue ticks, my, my, my grandpa. And my dad said, because we don't care where the coon's at. We want to know. We don't care. We don't care where he's been. We want to know where he's at, rather. So coming from that background, I had a walker dog that was clover bred. And that walker dog was a coon dog by, by shot. But I was into the beagles right then. But this walker dog was the last dog out of my dad's stuff. And I probably wasn't putting the energy into it. I'm not making excuses because I think excuses for people that are not working hard at something. So I'm just telling you, I wasn't working very hard at it. But I had a walker dog. It was the last of my dad's stuff. And I went hunting with this gentleman, Jeremy Arborough, that had, he originally raised Jet Six. He was the original guy that, that started him from a puppy, got him going, made him what he was. So when Jeremy and I went hunting one day, he really wanted that puppy. And he told me he, his female was bred. So we, we went coon hunting with Mr. Ed Mead one night. And Steve, you want me to tell you just raw, like we should just tell things, I think? Absolutely. My dog treed a possum that night. And just, it was one of those nights where my dog just was not doing what I normally would see him. We've all had the nights, but this was really bad. Like, I treat a possum for Pete's sakes, probably because, I don't know, maybe he wasn't smart enough to turn it down. I don't know. But it, so I looked really bad the first night I went hunting with that meat and his Jet 6 dog just pew, pew, pew. Like, and we're hunting like puppies out of Jet 6 and, and out of Jet 5, and they all sound the same, but daggummit, they're just had real good, clear, tender mouths, and they, they were staying tree. They was tree dogs. So, you know, I told them guys, made a joke. They all made fun of me. I couldn't believe Larry Harvey was with us that night and a few other gentlemen. He had some dogs out of Queen that he was running. And, 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 and it was kind of funny because I always said all my life, every time I got whipped, I got a new dog with beagles, cur dog, mountain fights, whatever. I've always upgraded. If I seen something better, I just got it. And those boys whipped me that one night, and I went back for more. And then um, you know, Jeremy mentioned something to me about those puppies, and I got involved in the female, which was 
Jet Seven, Jet Seven's mother, and I owned the litter mates to Jet Seven. Um, Ed took Jet Seven, and I'm glad he did because he got to carry on the line, and I took the two litter mates, and that's that's where that began. It was it was it was where I got my butt whooped by Mr. Ed Mead really bad because when I went back down in the next couple times, the butt whooping didn't stop. He just kept on tree and coon on me, so I went ahead and jumped ships. My ship was floating, Steve, so I just jumped boats. <laughs> well understood. Well, you know, I could sit here for an hour, and I probably should uh, do that at some time and just talk about the awesome hunts and uh, training sessions and times around the table uh, uh, with Ed and Jeanette and, and there at, at their place. And uh, uh, there's just so many things to say about Ed. And, and uh, Ed is not an outspoken guy. He's a soft-spoken guy. And, uh, you know, but when you're around him, he just uh, uh, just emits all of this uh, training knowledge and this patience and these he's an innovator. I think he was probably the first one to use a fishing uh, landing net to train puppies with. And I think some of Ed's videos may still be on YouTube. Do you know if they are or not? Yeah, there is. There's still a few videos and. And, and and like I said, I, I've always, uh, you know, really respected Ed Mead. But after I got the blue ticks from him, I seen some things that I I did I did not like. But the the fishing net was cute. But you know, I don't I don't like my children and my lady lying to me or my mother. So I really don't want my dog lying to me. So I don't really want it chasing any sight at all. I want it so natural that yeah. it goes bug eyed over looking at or smelling some scent. Rather okay, than can I inter can I interrupt you there? Sure, and, and maybe. Uh, clear up a misconception those puppies are not chasing that net by sight they are chasing that net by scent ed has a what i call a walk-in coon cage and well, I've uh, been Ed's, you've I've been, been there Ed's right? a lot of times yeah. raising yeah. raise puppies well, with them i've seen a lot of it i just i, I adopted a, a different technique because i i believe if you raise your kid your children on coon you you your dog on coon you end up with coon dogs if you raise your children on drugs they're going to end up on drugs if you mm -hmm. raise your children on coon hunting you're going to end up with a coon hunter so i i adopted some of that from ed mead in the how he did it but like you're right his techniques and his knowledge um just gave me the spark from my own to twist a little bit but like the net i was not a big fan of the net like i ended up seeing some things that i did with mm -hmm. the net and, 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 and intelligence wise where I think I went back up a few times and treat coon on that meat and the rapid rate. And the one time they pulled every dog they had out of the box and I did it with Mr. Ron Taylor stuff. I mean, I'm not going to lie. They were, you know, I bred my litter mate to jet seven to Ron Taylor. Cause there, there were some gentlemen talking about him at the hunt. And I guess the reason why they were talking poorly about Mr. Ron Taylor is because he probably treats some coon. Mm -hmm. So I went over and crossed my dogs on to Mr. Taylor stuff and, when I went back up there, it was like three or four o'clock in the morning and me and Mr. Mead only standing in the field in the cornfield. And my dog, I don't know how many tree, but it just is looking good that night. I went over, grabbed a track, went over and slammed the coon. And I said, Ed Mead, if you're going to get your butt kicked, at least you got it kicked by your own dogs. That dog's got a couple more shots of Jet 5 in there, I think. So we giggled and laughed. And, and, and I think Ed Mead um, has always been a mentor of mine. But it made me, that's what made me, and I think that's what's important about our sport. It made me want to be a better trainer to, to kind of switch it up a little bit. But mm -hmm. Ed Mead, I did get a lot of knowledge from Ed Mead and my star. So that's yeah. why I always, kept, I always kept the jets on all my dogs. Like the original airplane, all that I got from Jet 9. You know, when Ed Mead and Danny Glista split up, I was such a fan of the winning they did with Mr. Jeff Teagues. Uh, do you know Jeff Teagues? I uh, possibly have met him. Uh, my first experience with the Jet Dogs was with Jet 4. Okay. And uh, yeah. that was in 1983 when I judged him in the night champion division at the Michigan State Championship. So I asked Ed Mead, I asked Ed Mead if Jeff, what Jet 4 did, and he jumped right to the, to the Jet 5 dog. But I think the Jet 4 dog was what Larry Harvey told me set it all off to the split tree. Steve, what's your opinion on that? 
Well, I, d- I don't really know about that. All I know is that when I first started uh, going to Ed's and, and uh, oh, there's a whole, I could talk for an hour about this, but uh, when I first started going over, most of the puppies that Ed was working at that time were out of Jet 4. Uh, they, I saw puppies at three and four months old. Um, I'll give you one little incident. Uh, take a coon in a cage on a dog box, have a couple of puppies in a box that are about three and a half months old, uh, go out to the top of a hill and turn this coon loose down over the hill through a pasture field uh, toward this pond. Watch the coon go all the way to the pond, which is about uh, 150 to 200 yards. See the coon swim the pond all the way across that pond, which was about, I'm going to say, 50 to 75 yards across, go out of sight over the hill, get the puppies out of the dog box, set them down on the ground. As soon as they get their feet on the ground, they start swinging their heads around to and fro and opening, turn those two pups loose, see them run that track just like they were tied to it all the way to the edge of the pond. One of the puppies, as soon as he got to the edge, he bailed out right in the water just the way the coon went and swam across that 50 to 75 yard pond the other pup went around the edge of the pond. They got back together on the other side, figured the track out, and left down over the hill out of hearing. We got in the vehicle, drove around, and we could hear the puppies barking, kind of a muffled sound. We walked in. There was a tree stand right there, a deer stand, but right down the hill from it, just a few steps, was a hollow snag. And in that snag were both of these puppies, tree in every breath, and the coon setting up in that snag. These were three and a half month old puppies. Yeah. It was yeah. one of the most impressive displays of puppies on well, a coon it, that I'd ever said, seen. I always said that my start, I, I, when I started these dogs, I, I started with the most intelligent. The reason I upgraded, it was the most intelligent dog I've ever seen in my life. So. The reason why I went to the Blue Ticks was for the reasons you're talking about, Steve. But um, a couple times I went up there and split treat off Ed with some of the Ron Taylor stuff that I put in there. And I was split treating at a rapid rate, you know, five, six months old on old dogs. Mm -hmm. And I think Ed, one of my dogs got out of the kennel up there that had some blood in it that was 11 weeks old that went and treated her own coon by herself. So you're talking about natural ability. Like I've been up to Ed's on that pond watching dogs do like bionic superhuman stuff for a lot of years but I, I think for me the youngest I ever taught one that I turned loose got struck and treat was 11 weeks old and the other one was uh, uh, 13 weeks old and we we turned the loose they went cast it free one went and treat on the den tree and the other one went and treat on the thing so I mm-hmm. just I just kept enhancing that gene and like Dave Dean said you know if you like what you got at home why go out to eat you know I just kept three quarter and out what I already had with Mr. Mead stuff, and I kept sure. four months stuff that was dominant. And I say dominant, Steve. I want to talk about dominant genes a little bit. I think if you take, you know, a family of people that are at Walmart and you see all the kids, they all look like dad or they all look like mom. There's a dominant gene there. So I picked up a couple real hard, hard, smoky river, gritty, bear dog stuff locally here. And when I did that, I put the uh, Smoky River's blueberry choice dog in there, and I put, you know, uh, it, and it, what happened was I went over to Mr. Alex Ward's house and he had uh, a dog named Stonewall Jackson. And I was intrigued by it because it was the best outcross that I ever put on the jet dogs. I get over to this man's house and he's got these puppies and they're like seven, eight, maybe nine weeks old. And they're running around and they're like treeing like Ed Mead stuff. And I'm like, oh, well, it's jet, jet stuff? Like uh, That's jet stuff, right? Like I've never seen anything other than the jet dogs be that natural at that age, Steve, for me. Mm-hmm. I've never, you know, I've been allowed a lot of hounds. I've never seen anything. So when I'm talking to this gentleman about this, and he's like, no, 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 no. And I'm looking at him like, so that was my outcross was the Smoky River uh, Blueberry mm-hmm. Choice, which w- went back to a dog named Stonewall Jackson. And then that dog was uh, Mike Ryder's bandit dog, whatever was in there. Um, and I also picked up some Smoky River off of Mark Beer. But whatever's in Mark Beer's stuff in that Smoky River, put a new gear for me and a few things, but 
I think that, you know, seeing both those natural outcrosses and throwing a dominant gene in there, I think what Ed, what Mr. Dave Dean was referring to is, is, you know, the line breeding that he did, when I learned kind of how to do it with different genes, I always said, three quarter in what you already like and pick up a dominant outcross. So I picked up a big mouth, a dog that could breathe, which was the dancer dog, and some of the flipping, you know, Smoky River stuff that I threw in there. I think it, it really took it to a new level for me on competition because mm-hmm. now I could breathe. I'm more accurate. You know, I just, you know, I watch these dogs and being jealous of these walker dogs, how hard they could treat, but mine couldn't. So I think just doing the project and walking, watching how Dave Dean and the, and, and, and the legends did it before me, Ron Taylor and, 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 and Ed Mead, I learned from the people. That's why I named, you know, my dog Jets, Northern Blue Airplane, the original one. And he was a pretty neat dog, but he got hurt at a young age. But um, I want to go back a little bit, though, and, and, and I know we prior are running out of time, but I want to talk about Jet 8 a little bit. When Danny Glista and Ed Mead were partners and they split up, I was a fan of Jeff Teagues and the handling of that. And, you know, he, he was always a mentor because he was like, like Jeff Teagues could get in there and he could really handle a dog. But he was good with a dog that he could call trade the right way. And he'd go in and win some casts. And I was proud of watching the blue tick breed become grow and just and just and just get energized by this man going around with this jet eight dog and just kind of like with the big country stuff you know just grew the blue ticks i mean go blue you know they're trying to get me to hate go blue i'm I, so i think that just watching that happen i was a fan so when danny gliston had me split up i was a fan of the jet nine because of larry harvey and some of that stuff and then i was a, a fan of of gauge because i mean that stuff was just good so I made that cross, and when I made that cross out of, um, you know, the gauge, I bred one real nice female to gauge, and I bred one real nice female to Jet 9. When I met the two puppies, the only difference, they were both them dogs were out of Jet 8, of course. So when, 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 I, when I got them puppies on the ground, I ended up keeping a puppy out of Jet 9. It was kind of a leftover, and that being the, the original airplane dog, it, it re-educated me on how Coons played the game. I never seen a dog could go in there, shut dogs out and get struck and treat on a white one. They didn't even know a coon was there. I'm used to that, that, that cold nose blue dog sitting around on a log trying to tell a story and not knowing the right enough. So now I still have a cold nose dog that's getting treat all the time, but just looking at how that hall played out when I've seen Gene that come off of jet nine, I went and searched that dog and tried to buy it. I can't buy, I don't have Ed need money to buy a dog off anybody. And I say that, those dogs were worth a lot of money. I, I couldn't do it, but I had a real nice dog out of gauge, young female out of gauge in some of my stuff that Danny Gliss had that was a real nice young dog, big, huge mouth. And the gentleman that owned Jet 9 at the time really liked this female, and she did. She had a beautiful locate, just threw some scruff to it out of gauge. Uh, I just think the gauge female stayed on the ground a little bit too much for me. I wanted my dog treat a little bit more. So the Jet 9 stuff, when I seen the airplane, it educated me. The original, I saw after that dog, and this gentleman that owned Jet 9, um, he liked the female so well. I said, hey, look, I'll trade you half, and I'll buy the other half. And I wanted the dog. So as soon as I got the dog, which was Jet 9, when I owned that dog, I, I remember him being on my hill, just thinking he was wired like a, a, um, a very spiritual wild horse that if you caught it out west and threw a rope around and brought it home and you broke it, you probably have a pretty good and very good judge of character. He was very, like if bad people come around, he would booger bark. And I thought to myself, what a, what a unique creature. And that dog got loose one day at my cabin. And I live in Bigfoot country in Southern Ohio. It's a cabin. There's <laughs> you're, you're just, you know, it's just a lot of area to get lost. I don't know um, if you're familiar with Salt Fork. Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. He gets loose in Salt Fork area where there's creatures down there. It might have, you know, eight stuff. So he gets loose there. And, um, I get up the next morning. I own Jet 9. Now all of him. And, like, this is a dream, right? And I, I thought to myself, I'm just going to hold this dog back anyhow. So I really wasn't planning on keeping the dog, but I was. I, I was just so proud of owning a Jet 9 dog. Like, really? Like, now I own one? And so he gets loose one morning. As he gets loose, I go and chase him down. When I go to chase him down, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry there. I, was, I had to take care of something. But w- when I chase him down, the neighbor tells me down in my cabin, which is about a half a mile from my house, the next-door neighbor says, hey, Norm, 
how long has this dog been loose? I'm like, I don't know. What do you mean? I said, I went to bed last night. I woke up. He said, this dog's been down here since two o'clock in the morning, Tria. And this was like daylight. I'm drinking coffee. It's like nine o'clock in the morning. I, I woke up at the cabin and heard him treat. She was missing, heard him treat. She so want to talk about somebody who can't afford a dog that's got money in the dog that can't afford a dog. Now it's missing. And I hear it treat. I'm like, who? So I don't know if that right there, that gene, just that tree dog, that whatever, it was intrigued me so bad. I went straight to the veterinarian and I made sure that I had some stored semen off the, the Jet 9 dog. And um, I think that it'll help our breed. So I kind of did it just for the respect that I had meat. I, I have semen um, out of Jet 9 right now because Jet 9 and Jet 6 is my favorite Jet dogs. And I've hunted with all of them a lot. Okay, well, that's a, a, certainly uh, a heritage of hounds right there, and and I have so many fond memories of my days in Michigan, and of course Dave Dean, you know, lived not very far from me, and uh, all those guys up there in that group, and uh, and I know that there is a Lee Sherburn uh, uh, memorial hunt that's uh, being planned. Uh, I sent a, a book up as a donation to that event that. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Larry Harvey uh, is the one that uh, doing that. I I could be wrong on that. I apologize if I if I gave the wrong name. Uh, okay, Nor, let's swing the pendulum back here a little bit uh, about the one on one coon league. What do you think is the future of this? Where is it going? Uh, are you still enjoying it? Is it something that you want to see go forward? Just what are your thoughts? Um, you know, I say, Steve, if I could call you Steve, correct? Steve's what you go by. Don't go by Steven. Like when you were younger, was you Steven? And then when you got smart, they started calling you, hey, Steve. No, well, my family members all called me Steven. And my I have a unique middle name. It's Ford, like the truck. And okay. if I heard Stephen Ford, then I knew I was in trouble. In fact, Ella does that to me now. When I hear Stephen Ford, I know she means business, and she <laughs> she wants my attention right away. Okay, so if we ever get real tight, Stephen, maybe I'll call you that, huh? But it's okay, we'll call it Steve, right? Steve is um, what most people know me by, and that's fine with me. I'm going to try to not ramble off on a rant, and, and, and I say that because we know guys like us, uh, we have that we have that charisma and and I think listening to you go off on your rabbit stories I enjoy them so I very seldom people talk that say things that are important enough for me to pay attention to because I think life's got us busy uh, Steve but I would like to say that as far as the pendulum going back to the Coon League if to put it to best words in a short amount if I died in a fiery car crash or if I died on this motorcycle tomorrow, I wouldn't want anybody to be sad for me because I had one fine time here. I could have been born in a foreign country without the ability to know how to even be raised around this sport. So when my father passed, I was not sad. I was like proud of being part of this legacy. And I've always used the memories of him and coon hunting as a child, just different things that, you know, I could have been raised in the city, listening to police sirens like I am right now in different you know, I, instead, I was raised in this view. So I had one fine time. And I think just knowing that if I pass, I'm please, no one be sad for me if I if I pass in a, in a fiery car crash, because I think I've changed the direction the way the coon hunting competition world is. And if my father was here, he'd be very proud of that. And if my grandpa was here, he'd probably fall over flipping, fainting, just like Fran Sanford and son, you know, uh, on, 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 you know, no, I mean, like. This is the big one, Elizabeth. I'm coming, <laughs> right. to, I'm coming to be. I'm coming to meet you, baby. <laughs> I think you know. Just, I would be happy knowing. So the future to answer your question in a few words, and I think we talked about this. I warn you, if you're going to ask me questions, I, they weren't going to be any short stories because even my short stories are long. That these words I'm still looking for. Don't be sad for me, because if I die in a fiery car crash, I think the rest of the world, the Coon League is going to continue. One of my sons, one of my children, somebody will step up and continue what I started. People want to say, Norm, like they're doing this, they're doing what you're doing. I don't care what the poor people, all oh, they're deleting stuff. No, Facebook was deleting stuff. And it was just, it's been a big police racket for two years of trying to get this thing where people would 
not argue and bicker, but yet be proud of their dogs and their hard work. And just, you know, now that it's there, I think what I want for in the future of it, it it's already been planted. It's there. Like I said, the fact, the fact that, you know, UKC is going to now adapt some of this stuff and maybe, you know, spotlight some dogs and stuff when, when I, that's a win-win for me. So whatever happens, I don't care if anything happens for the Coon League. We're not, we're a non-profitable organization at this point, and we're trying to actually get maybe something set up to where, yeah, maybe we could be a profitable organization, but we don't have any money right now at all. So it's just hard to actually go and think that we're going to be, you know, PKC or UKC one day. Right now, we're just going through the motions and having a good time. And like, we had an incident where the camera went down on the last bow and it was kind of like some shady stuff to the point where, man, we didn't have the people with us, you know, the camera don't lie. So we're going to, we're going to redo it. And this English dog was pretty nice. Chad and they had us down in Southern Ohio, down there in Zanesville. And it was just one of those deals where I think we're going to go back at it because we lost the camera. I and got you. It didn't get beat, didn't get seen. So I think if we take cameras in there and we have now the technology, I believe, to get us into some of these woods, not all of them, um, we need to take the camera with us. Our, our dogs are pretty. Let's go to TV. I want I want the I want blue ticks on TV, and I'll quit. Well, okay. Just for our listeners out there, and for me because I'm interested, tell me how the rules work and on how you devise the rules for the competition. Well, I have a friend of mine that's that's on the Coon League, and he was always a supporter from the beginning, because I think he was a, you know, you talk to this gentleman, it's, you know, Bill Jordan from Whitetail Outdoors? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay, when this gentleman answers the phone, Steve, he's got a very distinctive voice like yours or eyes, maybe, perhaps, maybe even more, but he sounds just like Bill Jordan, and his name's Todd Sellers, and we was going back and forth, and I had this idea of how I was going to make this, this we got to change the rules a little bit, but I thought to myself, you know, all the laws that are being broken, the, the sheriff is standing here at each one of these towns breaking the law and pointing the fingers that we're all breaking the law. But yet there's so many laws that we're all breaking them. I think the laws in these rules in UKC and PKC were being used to, you know, take a dog down as well as pick one up. And it was the handler doing it. So I wanted to eliminate that. And this gentleman, Todd Sellers, I think he he had that balance to the same opinions to me as I had for him on, on what I thought, we probably are late raising our children, um, Steve, the same way. So Todd Sellers has got English dog, got the Stoke dog, very big mouth dog, like to watch his videos. Him and I went back and forth and we just talked and discussed these rules. And I just basically eliminated all the rules and stuff that, and just let's make it a coon hunt. I don't care if you grab your dog, bring your flipping chihuahua. If it could treat more coon, I got a couple of, you know, hunts coming up. When I get my little mountain feist trained, I would like to flip and go out with Jeff Stowler and whoop his little flipping PBR dog and teach that jammer to go two miles and three a coon. So, I think that any dog, we're not going to discriminate. We don't need a red street. We don't need a, we've already now starting crossbreed. Let's just bring your dog. Whatever you can do inside there, you can use a garment. We're going to use that for judging. We've seen a dog leaving a tree the other night. And we can see it. Well, it's just now. Why don't we use that technology for that rather than cheating? I think their laws are so set up. Technology is now advanced where we know we're going to use whatever technology we can. A camera, a fluid thermal. We still need to see it with a naked eye, whether it be a camera or whatever. But that just alone is we're using our technology. The judge has got the Garmin's on there. They can see the dog. And you know, there's no, the, the Garmin and the camera don't lie. So I think we're moving to that. But their laws and rules that they have in their kennel clubs are not going to allow them to get here. But they figured out how to way to adapt it. And I appreciate it. Like I said, I appreciate the support. And even the ones hating on me, like, you know, UKC and a few others. And I don't want to mention any names, but I think even the ones that were hating on me for it at the beginning, now they're even giving me some respect. Like, no, Nora, appreciate it. Hey, thanks for what you're doing. My inbox is plumb full of 15 to 20 maybe more of big, long paragraphs, how, Norm, I appreciate you're doing for the sport. Norm, I've known you for a long time. Norm, I don't know you. Hey, I live in a different country, but what you're doing is cool. So I think that that following now, my dog gave me the voice because of Ed Mead and Dave Deans and Ron Taylor's hard work at what they did and some of the other dogs I picked up. I think their hard work gave me a voice. Their hard work and me picking up that Smoky River out of 
Stonewall Jackson down here in Ashland and won the Ashland Spring Hunt so many times. I've won that hunt five times. They kicked me out of it two or three times for treating raccoon, but they let me back in it. I always won fair and square. And and, and even the point where I think we had some camera and some non hunting judges through some of it because I was getting treated poorly. I think that those dogs' talent and those people that bred them dogs before to give me the ability to keep on and twist it and get it to where it needed gave me the ability to let a man cheat me in a cast, go live on him, tell him he don't have to take his minus when his dog slick treat. And even though his dog left, I think my dog was trained an extra coon. Thank you, Dave Dean. Thank you, Ed Me. Thank you, Ron Taylor, for all the hard work in the roads and stuff that you traveled to get the blue dogs where they're at. Um, you know, I even like to thank Mike Shepard. I mean, he's done some good work with the blue ticks and some of these guys. They, we've all been working hard for the same thing, but the jealousy in our sport and within our breed has hurt us. But all them guys work together, me swallowing my pride. And when I went and got Ron Taylor stuff and switched some of the blood back and forth, I shared the blood. I end up having a dog right now. He's going to treat Kuna at a rapid rate, cold nose. He's going to be treated all the time. And I think that's gave me a voice because when I started that, if I, nobody cares about you. If you're not, I'm trying to come up for air. I'm kidding. I don't need any. I can breathe well. I work out. I'm trying <laughs> to come up. I work out. I'm trying to come up with. <laughs> don't put your light on my dog. <laughs> but look, I mean, okay, so, like, I think that's where it's at. I mean, it just the dog gave me a voice. All these people's hard, legendary works in my breed gave me a voice. I'm treating coon. That's I a mean, good point. That's a good yeah, point. Yeah, no, it's like it's it it, it 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 warms my heart because I would like to say this, Steve. Can I ask you a question? I know it's this is the the well, I, yeah, you so, can but, ask me anything you want. All I have to do is have the producer delete it if I don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. Straight up, you ask me anything you want. Okay, so my question to you is, sir, um, would you be interested in a partnership on a dog with Ed Mead? Would I be interested in a partnership with Ed Mead? I would absolutely go into a partnership with Ed Okay, Mead. listen, I got a man that I went hunting with him, and I'm not used to him having no dog power. Usually he's got dog power, and he, even though he's very humble. When I went hunting with Ed, I have a gentleman that's going to handle the dog. So all I need is the other partner, because Ed Mead, and I'm not saying my dogs are anything, but I got a female in my house. The dog's going to treat so hard, it's going to sound like Jeff Dunham and a puppet, Steve, okay? It's going to sound like two dogs in there. And I remember the first one I ever heard in a Pac-Man version, like, da -da 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 -da. I thought, what's that other dog in there? There ain't no other dog. Well, we didn't have garments back then. It was just a, we turn one dog loose, and that one's got a really big mouth, but there's two hounds in there. And I walk in, it's this Pac-Man dog, and the inhale that's breathing so hard in this dog's big chest cavity is sucking in air at a rapid rate, and it's blowing back. Well, that sucking in is making a noise, and it sounds like two hounds in there. That's what this dog's going to treat like, and I'd like to see Ed Mead look at it on a field track and maybe even win a world championship. Yeah. And I'd like to talk about it on here because I told Ed Mead, hey, look, Ed Mead's been so many places with his dogs. I could never probably ever fill his shoes. But I would like for – there's a very nice gentleman up there that just kind of helped Ed Mead with his dogs a little bit. Chad Trumbull said he told me he would hunt this dog if I could find a partner. Yeah, well, I, I think you got the wrong guy here for the partnership on a dog. But I thought your question was directed toward would I think that Ed Mead would make a great partner and I, a partner and I – Absolutely agree that he would. Uh, I'm a has-been coon hunter living down here in the worst place in the United States to coon hunt, and I've been <laughs> to most of them. But uh, you're you, to get to see Ed do that and accomplish that would be uh, would something do. that I would enjoy very, very much. Let me ask you. Oh, go ahead. Let finish your thought. Say, and then all we were going to do is put your name on the papers. So really, I guess I didn't communicate well. I mean, UKC kicked me out of uh, their uh, uh, kennel club for tree and raccoon. So all I was going to do is maybe put the dog in your name, put it in Ed Meats, and there's a gentleman up there named Chad Trumbull. And Brett Norman said they said they would hunt the dog and get the dog going. So I'm just basically going to go up there and I'm going to talk to Ed Mead like, hey, Ed, here's your dog. You need to call Mr. Field or he's down in Florida probably somewhere sitting on a beach. <laughs> Sit in a <laughs> you might want to call him because he's your new partner and just turn the dog loose and let you guys watch. Can we do it? <laughs> you you talk to Ed and I, I'll talk oh, to God, Ed. If I and we'll ask Ed the same question. I'm, I'm going to well, ask Ed. I'm gonna well, go he might house. say, heck no. You know, I tell you what, um, Norm, 
you know, all my plot buddies almost disowned me when I got a walker dog, you know. I don't know what they'd do to me if I came up with a blue tick. But no, in all seriousness, uh, Ed Mead, uh, super guy, somebody I respect very, very much. Hey, can you real quickly tell me about the point system on your one-on-one hunts? I wanted to ask you about that, how that came about and how that works. Basically, how it's set up is is, is, is you bring your own judge. So you, with the camera, we really don't need a judge arguing and fighting and people voting. So you bring your own judge, and when you, you bring that judge, that judge is going to have uh, the ability to say, hey, man, something's not right here, and hopefully we got a camera that can back it up. So those two judges, which we've not had no trouble because I have a judge and the opponent has a judge. Or let's say, for example, Steve, if you're in a one-on-one, you're going to bring your friend, Ed Me, and you're going to show up, and Ed Mee's basically just going to be there to make sure the rules that are written are kind of being followed. But we're going to have this camera and all these people watching, so it's not really much of an argument. It's just like one of those deals where the, the wind just gets knocked right out of your sails when you walk into a, a slick tree. And if there is a hole there and we give a dog the benefit of the doubt, we're going to give the benefit of the doubt because we have so many friends watching that's going to judge us if we make a decision that's not right. We're not going to flip and let dogs go three trees over. And if we do, I think we're going to ask the people, hey, look, we're going to get a panel together. You're it. Here's the poll. Did the dog move or did the dog go? If we can prove it on Garmin or show it that it moved, we want to use the camera. So the camera is kind of our jury. And basically, if you strike your dog, it's just to let the camera know that, hey, and the judges, hey, we got two dogs. We got them on Garmin. It's telling those judges, hey, look, one dog's over here. One dog's over here. It's letting them judges know what dog's barking. And it just gives them an idea. So, But it means nothing. It's a modified strike to the point where I think, you know, talking about dogs fibbing to you, I think that's the biggest game we got right now is these dogs barking, and I'm running a very, 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 very cold-nosed dog, and a walker dog's barking 552,000 times per mile, chasing my dog around, and it's really not saying nothing because I know for dang sure it don't smell coon like mine can. And I don't mean that to be funny, but I've seen there's a problem with our dogs lying to us. So I think the babbling and stuff is just a handler thing, so we don't have that. We basically have, hey, and that's why we can relax, Steve. We can kind of take it back, and we can relax a little bit, we can we can basically go back to coon hunting, and if we have to, we can you know pick on peewee because you know peewee don't have no buddy. Sometimes you get picked on, you like it because you know hey, peewee's the new motivation. Well, you know? okay, but just just to take it one little step further, as I see it coming up, you have just like a one and a plus or a two and a plus. Explain how that works. If you hear your dog communicate to you like, "Hey, I got the groceries." You put your dog on paper, you have one minute. That one minute is going to give a chance. And I think if a dog's right in there and they're together and we're watching them on Garmin and bam, they get it. I think a dog treat a half a coon because that's what it did. I mean, even if one dog drives the track in there, I've seen so many times where one dog takes the track and drives it in there. And that dog that's got that tight nose is sneaking over here, just goes in there and gets the tree on a dog. I mean, that other dog that drove that track all the way in there, that that other dog wouldn't have made it because it couldn't smell it to begin with. They wouldn't have been in the vicinity with the coon. I think it's still that dog that drove that track in there deserves, you know, and I'm not trying to make it up for just my dog. I do have a cold-nosed dog that can move a track the same as a hot one, but I'm talking about I'm going to take a, 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 a half a coon for that. So if you get treed within a minute, we run one minute. If you get treed, you get a half a point. So now the first dog got one coon. The second dog's got a half a coon. So. And it goes same way for your minus points, you know, and you have to win with raccoon. There's no, we're not going to win with no minus points and who had the least amount. Who's, who jacked up the least tonight's the winner? We can't do that because we, we would end up with a bunch of dogs that were no good. And we don't want dogs running around at a rapid rate treating raccoon uh, that ain't there in trees with no leaves on them. So we want coon dogs. So we were just going to take it to where, you know, it's the same in as the same out. And, you know, uh, the tiebreaker's sudden death, you know, like you're one-on-one, like you'll go back in, you got one match, just like the crawdad going back in after the piece of Belvita cheese, you know, you're going back in, wham, you know, trying to get one last coon treat and sudden death. So if we're sitting at zero, we still need a coon treat. So our three hour format came up with the idea, not so much where the red fern grows, but my grandfather telling me stories about how it would just be like people that would talk smack back in the day and how it was when hunts first started, it was 
you know, and listen to people like Ron Taylor say, no, they were three hours long. And so I thought, you know, the longer the competition, Steve, the more the separation of the competition there's going to be. And these short little one hour casts are going in and, 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 and rambling them through is making people profits. I get it. It's getting they're getting three or you know two or three losers which each cast so that money then they take and keep and spread out to the winner and keep for themselves so they have their salaries. I just don't I don't want that. So I just kept it to where it's just one on one, mano a mano. We split what we enter for. So if we enter our dogs, we we pay our judges and everybody and just try to keep it to where it's just fair. It's not we don't want to we don't want to win in the Coon League off of losers. We want to help the losers get a new dog. I mean, maybe just on camera with all their buddies watching, somebody be like me and be like, yep, that me, you get my butt. I'm getting a new dog. So you come over the blue one like yours, Mike, because if, if Ed Me says, yeah, your name's just going to be on it so he can register. <laughs> they won't let me in there. They kicked me out. And I never did figure out why. Oh, my goodness. Well, okay, that brings up a point, and then we're going to have to, to uh, bring this episode to a close. But only if you'll promise you'll come back, Norm, because I know we've got a lot more that we need to talk about. Uh, we've been at it here back. about an hour and 21 minutes uh, by the clock. So we try, and of course I'll have uh, a visit from my, my buddy uh, Fred Moran, the Redbone Man. Our listeners enjoy hearing what Fred's been doing, the 85-year-old coon hunter over in Pennsylvania. All right, I'm going to ask you this question, and uh, on the surface, it it's just what it is. Norm Starling is a controversial guy. You have people online that love you, think that what you're doing is the greatest thing since sliced bread. There's people on there, and I've seen the remarks, and of course, I have a site called Coon Hunting Conversations, and we don't let people be as my grandmother used to say, ugly on there. They have to keep it straight up or they don't stay. We have people who are not Norm Starlet fans. What do you say to those people out there who don't really know who Norm Starling is? Does it really bother you that some people don't like you? Does it really turn you on to know that so many people do like you? How does that all feel to you? This notoriety that you have, people know your name now. Uh, it's basically a household name in the coon hunting, uh, online coon hunting community. How does all that affect Norm Starling day to day? Can I call my buddy Ed Mead right now, like phone a friend, like on TV, and be like, <laughs> hey, Ed, I'm coming up there, and we'll do episode two with Ed Mead. Now, I'll drive up there, and we'll set up up there at Ed's house, and I'll present his dog with half Steve Fielder's name on it and half his, and then we're going to talk to Chad Trumbull, because Chad Trumbull's going to Chad Trumbull's gonna, gonna go ahead and, and train it right there around Ed. That way, Norm. Ed's got to hunt. And then we then what we'll do is we'll just do episode two when we get that dog tuned up because see it's a litter mate to airplane four. Nice female. We'll take that dog and we'll just show up to a one on one hunt. We'll do episode two with you and your buddies and your walker dog and we'll let the camera watch that meat flipping whoop somebody. Very good. But you're avoiding my question. What has all of this notoriety done to Norm Starling? Is it something that you enjoy, something that you, uh, when when somebody says something derogatory toward you or toward your game, how does that affect? Answer me, please. The only thing that answered me, I don't know if I can do it quick, but I'll try. So ready? Okay, I'm so ready. my mother being upset about it was probably it. You know, other than that, my mom going on there and sticking up for me a little bit and making comments, it, it ailed me a little bit because, um, you know, as far as the rest goes, um, you know, it started out in second grade for me, Steve. You know, it was this has not just been going on. You know, this started out in second grade when the kid that was supposed to be the bully in the classroom said he was faster than me at the end of the playground. And then come to find out that he don't know what it's like to run through the woods. And you get a lot of flipping, you know, you get a lot of muscles worked when you're jumping over logs rather than a pavement. When I got to the end of that pavement, I was a little bit faster and the girls giggled. And then later that 
next afternoon recess, I got tackled, beat up by a couple of boys. I knew what was going on. You know, it would, you know, nobody's going to like a winner. So anytime you go in there and whoo, somebody, or you go in, and you do something good or you talk about, you know, not allowing some of that nasty negative on yours. Look, the more pretty you have, it's like a curse, the more that you're going to have. So I think the Coon League's got a lot of people there. So you're going to have a lot of both. You're going to have a lot of support. You're going to have a lot of hate. But I think the more people that open and give us a squeaky wheel and run your mouth and just get some tree dogs going, boys. And I think some of these kids are getting voices where the, normally they would just type them on, on, a, on, a, on a typewriter rather than come up. I've had some people come up at the Tournament of Champions last year kicking around at the ground after I kind of had – went live on him and he apologized for what? I'm like, for what? What are you apologizing, sir? He said, for cheating you. And that was it. I, you know, I, I, I got a lot of respect for the kids still do today. I ain't going to mention his name, but it, it, it motivated me to who cares. I have to consider the source. If you have a lemon throwing you lemons, why do you even care, Chloe? My daughter, I say to her all the time, let it. I learned the number one ingredient to love. And Steve, if we have to, we could do episode two, but I would like to share it with you. The reason why I love my dog is I, 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 my dog loves me. And I learned the number one ingredient to love for my firstborn daughter, Chloe. And when she wrote me a love letter, how she appreciated me being a good father after I took her to the water park that I couldn't afford. And it made me, it's propelled me to want to make more money, to want to give her a better life. It's probably the reason why I'm successful today, but her appreciating me and writing me a love letter before I go to work on a Monday morning after taking her a weekend visit to a water park and just telling me how that thank you for getting us ice cream as long as we appreciate it like the Amish kids, you know, it's okay. When she teaching me that, I always said learning from your puppies or your children and parenting, learning from them is real parenting. So when I learned the number one ingredient to love from my daughter, it affected my life. It financially made me stable. It made me want to work hard. Of course, I came from workers, so I was taught to work, but Really, I think the reason why I love my dog is because my dog loves me. And the Lord put me here and, and, and gave me such a creature to love so temporary. It's so pure and so beautiful. It only gives me 15 years of max. That if you spell that name backwards, it spells God, sir. And I think that not to get religious or, or, or political or anything else, I think anytime you have somebody that is going to throw daggers at you, you have to find the 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 good in it you have to find the godly in it you have to find the so i put that filter in my life and between that and knowing that i could be ignorant that i'm communicating wrong with maybe my spouse or my children working on those two filters i i let the lord sometimes direct me and i might drop a bad word once in a while and i might get upset at somebody for something that i don't know if i actually was guilty of and people want to judge me but at the point where i'm now in a situation where I don't know if I can change it. You know what I mean? I don't know if I can change it. I think the reason why I am that way is because of my love for a coon hound. And I think that if we can focus on that and the good and not the negative comments, why wouldn't it work? So I just kept on the internet and just kept putting honey back to people because now I got to preach what I'm talking because if I'm expecting this to influence somebody else, I got to keep it on. I got to be this guy. If I'm expecting my daughter to not throw lemons at somebody after they throw them at her, I got to start using honey. So, you know, a lot of times when people, when I travel the country working, they, they would be upset because my hillbilly butt would um, maybe not make a good direction on a lane change or something like that. People would get upset and they, they would be road rage and I would just wave at them. And I noticed the nicer I was to them to let them know, hey, my bad, I'm sorry. The more that they would not want to be aggressive and mean. So I just I, I've done the best I can on that coon leak to keep that down. But to answer your question, I put my norm armor on is what I call it. And sometimes that norm armor is this tough exterior guy that don't let any of that affect him. But no one likes to be treated poorly just like my dog. I appreciate my dog because my dog appreciates me. Well, if I treat my dog bad, my dog's not going to treat me good. So I try to use that in my techniques of training my dog. I try to use that and try to training my lady friend to treat me better so that I can treat her better. And they say training, I, you have to train the ones around you to love you how you're going to love them. And I think that the Kundalini is going to get to that and it's just going to take some more 
of just putting nice and new ideas out there. Nobody likes new, you know, so everybody gets upset when you get to change. But I think it's going to it's going to help the sport grow. So if I take and pick up negative, I'm going to run around and I'm just going to put out more negative, Steve. So I've learned to put this filter in my head and in my soul that if someone throws me them daggers, I got to have to not care. But it's been going on for a long time. I mean, as far as like whitetail deer hunting, I mean, I've shot some of the largest whitetails in the world, Steve, and, and shooting the most elusive creature in the world. And I'm not talking about just Ohio. I'm not talking about just the United States, but the most elusive creature in the world and, and mastering it. I worked really hard at doing that. I took time in my life and spit in the woods and, 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 and getting there in there and figuring it out. The more I was successful at it, the more they hated me and accused me of doing things poorly. So I, I really, at the point now, I'm at the age, I'm 47, as you asked me in the beginning. And I, I think that I have to walk as an example. If I'm going to be anything in life, I have to walk what I talk. And I learned that from my father and my heritage of coon hunting. Well, I think that's a great place for us to end this podcast today, Norm. It's been super Super to have you on. I think you've been straight up, candid with our our listeners. I can't wait to hear the reviews on this one. I wish you continued success with the one-on-one Coon League, with your Blue Tick Hounds. Uh, I do definitely want to have you back on a future podcast so we can talk about more of these things. And I certainly wish you a a, a good day. And uh, I. This is the time uh, of every podcast where I have to uh, ask the listeners, if someone comes up to you (laughs) and asks you, where's Steve Fielder these days? My listeners know the answer. He's gone to the dogs. Well, good morning. Did I uh, wake you up from your last night coon hunt? The day you wake me up, I don't care if you call 5.30 in the morning or 6 or whatever, you'll read about it in the San Francisco Chronicle. I'm an <laughs> early bird and an early riser. I if see. I sleep past 5.30, I'm usually up for sure at 7. You're afraid you might miss something, I guess. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, You've hey, got tell... a long time to sleep forever someday. <laughs> well, that's right. We sure do, and we we need to to be up and at them. I I realize the younger the younger the older that I get, uh, the less sleep I seem to need. But uh, I'm sure you got a good coon hunt story to tell me about. Did you go last night? I went the night before. I got. A girl was supposed to come up. I hunt with three different girls. Mm. One of them, I'm sure you know Patty Busy. She got black and tans and blue tick. I do. And she got some good dogs. And uh, she'll go every night if I call her. Uh, She loves to go. She does a lot of late hunting by herself. She'll go out 1 o'clock in the morning. She says nobody's around to bother you or holler, get off my property. and. That's her way of doing it. Uh, me, I go early. I go right right at do- uh, dark. And uh, usually, a lot of times, I turn the dogs loose. It's still daylight. And I've had good luck through the years. I used to do a lot of daylight hunting in the mornings in the summer. You go along the creek and start early enough, you'll tree some coon on the outside. And, uh, but anyhow, uh, I called bo- uh, this blonde bomber that won an hunts with me. <laughs> She's quite a trip. I took her with this young dog that I got not too long ago. Well, I think it was Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. And the dog split treed. Well, the dog I wanted her to grab off a tree was closer than the one I was grabbing. But I wasn't worried about that. We're walking down there, and it's a little thick. She gets a dog off the tree, and I'm sitting down there at the other tree waiting for her to come. Now, this dog will pull. He ain't going to pull me, but he'd pull a stranger and see what he could get away with. And I told him, don't, I told her, don't put up with that. Jerk him, 
I said, do anything you have to, but don't let him drag you. Well, he was so worked up getting to the other dog here in the M tree and down below. He pu pulled her down, run her head into a tree. She got a little lump on there. I think she was bleeding from the nose. I don't help him. I figured I'd let him fight it. Tough will make it out of there. I I didn't pay no attention. I just went to the other dog, got him on a leash, and we went to the truck, and she's in back there cussing and hollering. She said, how bad am I hurt? I said, you'll live. Don't worry about it. And we went to the truck, and she's snorting <laughs> all the way down the street, the uh, road, and she, uh, I said, I ain't going to listen to that all night. I said, I better take you home. I wasn't concerned about her health. I just didn't want to listen to her snorting all the time. So I took her home. It wasn't far away. And then I went coon up myself. You're after. such a compassionate man. Yeah, I know. Everybody <laughs> knows me like that up here. And I give ice water to an Eskimo. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> the next night, Bernie Karinchek called me. And wanted to go. I've been promising him, and every time something comes up, I says, "Come up tonight." Nobody's uh, called to go, and uh, so he came up, and uh, he has a little car that he hunts out. He has a couple of trucks, but he and a jeep. But he came in this little car, a little Subaru, and uh, I don't see no dog in this car. I said, "Where's your dog?" He said, "I didn't bring one." I says, so why didn't you bring one? He said, I want to see yours. I says, yeah. well, I said, if I'd known that, I'd have brought the other dog too and hunted them both. Well, he's hunted with Buster before. But he said, nah, just go we'll hunt the young dog. So <clears throat> we went to the woods, and it's, it's still daylight yet. It ain't dark enough. And I said, hey, we'll go to a place about 8, 10 miles from here where I used to live. I says, hunt there, and we'll try a coon there by the time we get there, and then we'll come back to this place. So we went over there, and we started out. The dog took off like like he should, and he finally barked two barks. I don't know what on, what he did, or why. He finishes everything he opens on. He has, anyhow. But he came back past me. And uh, he never stopped or nothing. And I thought, well, he's going to go to different territory. He's certainly leaving the territory where he barked twice. And I thought the second bark was a half, half uh, tree bark, but he never opened anymore. Well, he went down to Hala, and he gave probably four track barks and loaded up on a tree and sounded good. He he's a tree dog and he really knocked him off there. Bernie even called that man. He's a nice tree dog. We go down there in the coon chair and uh uh like I say he's up uh, way up in the top of the tree uh, as usual. But uh we got the dog and went out of there and then went back to the other woods that we was originally gonna start on. And we turned loose in there. <laughs> and he was in there a good while, probably close to a half hour, and ain't opened up yet, which is highly unusual in that woods. I usually get a strike within 10 minutes or so, but for some reason he didn't. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, he turned around, and he went, there's a reservoir there. I told you about this place before, and there's also a bit of swamp in there. And um, anyhow, he headed, we didn't know for sure where he <laughs> headed to. I took my tracker, and for some reason or another, it wasn't working. It worked the first two nights I used it, but it didn't work that night. But I hunt all my dogs with a light on, so I'm looking for the light to see where he's at. I know he's other than some of the brush, I could, should be able to see him where I think he's at. And we finally both spotted him after a while, and he opened up down in there, and it's like all swamp. It's at least up to your knees most places. 
And uh, the dog made a loss, I guess you call her. He just shut up. He didn't say too much for a while. Then he barks real odd like. I thought he was going to tree, but he's got an odd tree bark sometimes. I thought he was going to tree. And Bernie says, there he is. He spotted the light. And I shine my light. It looked like he was on a big mud bank and uh, that he couldn't get off of or something. And I looked at him for a good five minutes. I said, he ain't on no mud bank. He's up in a tree. And uh, I figured that's why he's barking on. And he was way up in that tree. It wasn't a big tree, probably only 15 feet high, but I'd say he was darn near the top. I'm looking for a coon up there. I don't see no coon or nothing. I says, we got to get him out of there, but I ain't getting wet. I blow my whistle, and he finally, all I know, I don't know if he fell out or he jumped out. I, I really think he jumped out. And, man, we heard that splash. I said, there must be a lot of water over there. I said, you hear that? He said, yeah. Well, the dog swam to us. We could see him swimming to us at different times. And <clears throat> he came over. We grabbed a hold of him. And uh, I looked at that tree over again. If there was anything in it, I sure didn't see it. And uh, our foliage this year, Usually we're covered by now. We got a lot of trees that need foliage. It just even late this year, too cold a uh, spring, I guess. But yeah, still, I wonder if that coon could have possibly jumped out of there, you know, <laughs> before you guys got there. But you would think maybe that the dog would uh, would have jumped out too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, another thing, he was soaking wet, of course. And it was getting cold out. My hands were freezing. I said, I should have brought gloves. And uh, <clears throat> anyhow, we just walked to the truck, and that was the end of our hunt. We didn't bother turning loose again. It's 1130. Not that that's late. It's just we were both cold. He didn't put enough clothes on. I'd have been okay if I had gloves. The dog come right to me, and uh, he definitely went down under from as well as he was. <laughs> well, Fred, it's pretty amazing that you're still hunting and, and hunting regularly at your age. And I know uh, when when we get uh, up a bit in age, as I am too, uh, you know, we don't like to talk about that a lot. We just want to go ahead and, and, and do what we always did. Our, our mind is uh, basically as young as it ever was. It's just the body that slows down some. But it, it's always amazing to, to visit with you, to talk with you, and hear about the stories of, of your hunts with your red bones. Uh, we've uh, used about 11 minutes here in this episode, so I know you've got a lot of stories for me. And I'm going to be calling you back on a regular basis. But uh, for our listeners who may not recognize that voice, that's uh, Fred Moran, the Red Bone Man, the 85-year-old coon hunter from the hills of Pennsylvania, who's a regular feature here on the Gone to the Dogs podcast. Fred, thank you so much for joining us again this week, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again. Hey, nice to hear from you. Give me a holler. You know where I'm at. We'll do it, sir. All right. Take care.